we've been talking about doing for a long time. And uh, what I'm going to hand out to you first is something which unfortunately is missing for many editions of Shulchan Aruch. What we're going to be doing in this shiur is kind of, in a way, uh, moving through several centuries because our ultimate goal is to understand the practical halakha, which is in the Shulchan Aruch. And for this purpose, we're really going to stick straight to the Shulchan Aruch, going through the Shulchan Aruch Be'ezrat Hashem, uh, step by step and uh, in order. And the Shulchan Aruch was written in the 16th century by somebody named Maran Arab Yosef Karo, who is, uh, if you could just hand that around, who wrote the Shulchan Aruch. First he wrote a, a book by the name of the Bet Yosef. The Bet Yosef is a commentary on an earlier work. So really, the, the, the work that everything is, is based upon is a 14th century work called the Tur, the tur or the Arba'at Turim, which was written by Arab Yaakov Bala Turim. A couple of centuries later, Harav Yosef Karo, who is also known as Marana Bet Yosef, wrote a commentary, a lengthy commentary called the Bet Yosef. That's where he got his nickname. And this commentary uh, spans basically the entire Arba'at Turim. What the Arba'at Turim was, was the first attempt to codify all of practical Jewish law that's relevant in contemporary times. And it was, it's a massive work. It's a very significant work. The Bet Yosef basically fills in the gaps of all the halachic discussion that took place from the time that the tour was written until the time that the, uh, that the Bet Yosef was written. And he also comes up with conclusions that he thought were sometimes at odds with what the tour said, sometimes in explanation of what the tour said. Um, but basically became the definitive halakha for Sephardic Jewry and to a greater or lesser extent for all Jewry but, uh, but definitely totally for, for Sephardic Jewry so the, um, the Bet Yosef explains in, in his commentary uh, in the introduction what his system was for determining the halakha that essentially he looked at three key sources the Rambam was one and we are going to look at the Rambam a great deal the, um, the Rif was another one the Rif was the first real code of Jewish law that preceded the Rambam by uh, a couple of centuries, actually, um, and is a different style code. It's, it follows the order of the Talmud. Uh, and then the third person was the Rosh, who was the, uh, who was the latest of, of the three poskim that the Bet Yosef was concerned with. So based upon the consensus of these three decisors, so whenever there was a halachic question, he would look at these three poskim. If two out of three agreed, he would go with that as the halacha. And, and what happened was, his commentary is so gigantic. The Bet Yosef is such a large and scholarly commentary, and you really need to know a lot to be able to, to really appreciate it. So what he did at the end was, he wrote a book called the Shulchan Aruch, the Shulchan Aruch literally means the set table. And what the set table is, is the conclusions of all the discussion in the Beit Yosef. Now these conclusions were placed into the same format as the tour, which means that just like the tour has four sections, that's why it's called the Arba Turim, the four sections of the tour are Orach Chaim, which is daily life, Yored De'a, which is basically ritual laws, Kashrut, family purity, and many other things that don't fit into any of the other categories, pretty much. Even Ezer, which is marital law, and Foshen Mishpat, which is civil law. So these are the four categories. Now this is different than the Rambam. The Rambam is all of the 613 mitzvot, even the ones that don't apply today. In fact, probably the majority of content in the Mishneh Torah of the Rambam doesn't apply today. But that doesn't matter because the Rambam's purpose was totally different than the Shulchan Aruch's purpose. The Shulchan Aruch's purpose was to provide a practical guide to halacha, to everyday life. So he doesn't need to talk about korbanot. He doesn't need to talk about the Beit HaMikdash because we don't have that today. The... The uh, Rambam, on the other hand, was trying to give a comprehensive understanding of the entire Torah, uh, which, from which, of course, halachic conclusions could be drawn. But his purpose was to give a comprehensive explanation of the entire Torah, in which case he has to in- include both the things that are applicable today and the things which are not applicable today. And in the Shulchan Aruch, though, we don't have that anymore. We only have the things that are applicable today. And the reason for the method that we're going to be using in this shiur, it's all based on an even later work, which is by the Ramchal, which incidentally is a very worthwhile book to get. This book is called Derech Chochma by the Ramchal. Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lutzato, the same person who wrote the Mesilat Yisharim, he's more famous for that than for this. Um, it's an amazing book. It's, as many of the works of the Ramchal, it's a dialogue between a teacher and a student. And the teacher and student are discussing what is the way a person should structure their learning and their growth in life. What should they do first? What should they do second? What should they avoid? What's a waste of time, etc.? 
And it's a short book, actually. The, the only reason why it's this thick is because this edition has so much commentary. But it would really be a tiny little book if it were, if it were only the text itself. And he gives an outline of how to learn halacha. And he says basically a person should learn the Rambam, learn the Shulchan Aruch, and when they contradict, he should go and look at the Bet Yosef's long commentary and figure out why. He said that's really all an average person needs to know. Anything beyond that is for the advanced student. And halavai that we even knew that much. You know, most people don't even know close to that much. So he says that's really the, the basics. He says, of course, that's, that's aside from knowing the entire Tanakh or the Midrashim. He gives a lot of other material that one needs to know. And he has a whole guide of how to get from the basics to the most advanced areas of, you know, Kabbalah and metaphysics and areas that we're not going to touch upon. But just in terms of his system for learning halacha, it dawned on me at a certain point that it's a very simple and it's a very clear way that anybody can really learn. Anybody can learn this way. If we don't get distracted by the commentaries and sort of sidebars that come up in Halakha, and we stick with the straight Shulchan Aruch and Rambam, we can learn a great deal and very clearly and very succinctly. And that's going to be the goal. So what I just handed out to you is unfortunately omitted from many editions of the Shulchan Aruch, which is his introduction. Now we're not going to read the entire introduction, but I'll point out to those of you who know Hebrew that it's written in rhyme and in lovely uh, uh, poetic uh, form. It's all, uh, it's all made of, uh, uh, of uh, you know, a sort of poetic uh, phraseology. But basically he talks about how he took the Bet Yosef, which was his extensive commentary, and is filled with all kinds of um, source material and all kinds of discussion and all kinds of analysis. And he said to himself that I want to take the best of this. I want to take the conclusions of this. I want to take the bottom line of this and make a book. And what he says is that I want to have a situation so that everybody, he says that all the Jewish people can have a knowledge of Torah to the point that when somebody's asked a question, he won't have to stutter over it. He can say to wisdom, you are my sister, which is a phrase from the book of Proverbs, the book of Mishlei, which means to say, to be so familiar with the halacha that it's so clear. And he says, that's the goal. As the Talmud says, just like it's clear to you that your sister, you can't marry your sister, so too should every halacha be clear to you. And he says, Because I want my book to be fluent in his mouth. Because it's Banui Letalpiot. Banui Letalpiot, the Gemara interprets this Pasuk from Shira Shirim. What does Banui Letalpiot mean? Tel Shakol Ponimbo. It's a pillar to whom all the mouths turn. In other words, if everybody turns to the Shulchan Aruch, we'll all have a fluency with the Halacha. Lechalakol Lechalakim Shiloshim. And the remarkable thing was, the, shulcha, the, the, the original concept that nobody follows today is, he said he envisioned the Shulchan Aruch being divided into 30 parts, only 30. Why? That a person could read one thirtieth of the Shulchan Aruch every day and thereby each month review the entire thing. And he says, and for the students, they would continually review this and go over it in more depth and understand the basis for it. But the, the main idea is that everybody should have a handy guide. That's why the Shulchan Aruch is very different from the Rambam. The Shulchan Aruch is written with an eye to practicality. So what's it going to start with? It's not going to start like the Rambam's book with the fundamental beliefs of Judaism. That's not the first thing you need to know practically. Practically, the first thing you need to know is what do you do when you wake up in the morning? And that's exactly how the Shulchan Aruch is going to be structured. So that's the first sheet. Good sheet to have because, unfortunately, I went searching and it's omitted from a lot of the, uh, from a lot of the text of the Shulchan Aruch. But the, um, the positive is that now on Wikipedia, they have these, you know, these Wiki texts, uh, functions on Wikipedia. Now, if you have Hebrew Wikipedia, you can get the entire Shulchan Aruch. It's not done yet. But somebody's keying in the entire Shulchan Aruch, the entire tour, the entire commentaries on the tour. It's amazing. And you can just like cut and paste it, which is what I did with that page. I just cut it off there. Kitsur Shulchan Aruch was written by an Ashkenazi much in the 19th century. It's much later. That's Shlomo Gansri. Total, no. No. Totally different book. Kitsur Shulchan Aruch is written by... Aruch HaShulchan is also 19th century. Aruch HaShulchan, they're both 19th century. Uh, the the Kitsur Shulchan Aruch was written by, uh, by an Ashkenazi rabbi, Rabbi Shlomo Gansfried. It's the Kitsur, that's why people like it, but it's a totally different, totally different. And the Aruch HaShulchan is actually a very good work that explains the Shulchan Aruch in depth, and it's very good, but also 19th century Ashkenazi. Uh, what is the Ramaz work? The Ramaz work is called, is, the technical name for it is the Mapa. 
Okay, wow. so he he and the this is the page we're going to do now. He and the uh, Beit Yosef were both working on. They both wrote commentaries on the tour, and they were both working on their summary works. And the Beit Yosef was first. He made it first. So what did what happened? The Rama said, "I'm not going to publish a separate work. I'm going to piggyback on his work, and I'm going to just add it as glosses to his work." And that's why it's that way. Instead of it being, a, that's why it's called the tablecloth. The mapam means a tablecloth. So instead of having a separate table, the shulchan aruch, every table needs a tablecloth, doesn't it? Right to cover it over where he made him, where quote unquote he made mistakes or he omitted the Ashkenazic view. Because definitely, the shulchan aruch is very clearly a Sephardically biased work. It really mainly, although in the Bet Yosef, he brings Tosafot and he brings the Ashkenazic commentaries, but in the Halakha, the, the, the leaning of, of, the, of the Halakha and of the Minhagim that he records is almost exclusively isn't, Sephardim. Isn't that, a, isn't that just a function of the fact that... That's who he was. Well, but not just that, but it's Beit Din, the Rosh, the Rosh is not a Sephardic... Yeah, but he was, he was for a Sephardic community. Yeah. Well, that's a whole other historical thing, but I mean, yeah. yeah okay. I mean, I guess one would debate. Somebody could debate whether the Rosh was as worthy of his was as worthy of his uh, 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 of being included as the other two because he wasn't a genuine Sephardi and maybe, you know, but he was... His purpose was to include an Ashkenazi... No, 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 no. Definitely yeah. not. No, I think that the, the reason why he included him was because he saw him as another so Sephardi. Yeah. Made, made, uh, Even though he was ethnically Ashkenazi, he he was the Rosh. Yeah, of, uh, he was the head of a Sephardi community. And so when the Rosh gave uh, the Nehalacha, he did he gave he gave it, gave it based on their so uh, uh, their game. Yeah, 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 for sure. Okay. I mean, the, even the even the he tour for an Ashkenazic yeah. work, the tour includes a lot of Sephardic minhagim, and the reason why he knew it was because his father was the Rosh. Oh, and so they lived in a Sephardic community, even though they were Ashkenazim. Okay. So they had the best of both worlds, pretty much, because they lived in a Sephardic community, but they kept their uh, personal minhagim. Now, this is a great Shulchan Aruch, by the way, and this is the one I copied it from. It's, it's, a, it's designed to learn the entire Shulchan Aruch in one year um, by splitting it up into a daily amount of Shulchan Aruch. And it's Minukad, which means it has Nikudot, and it's very easy to read. And uh, it's, it's just the Shulchan Aruch. And he has a nice piece in the beginning called uh, Kuntris Zeh Shulchan, where he talks about why the Shulchan Aruch is so important and why it's worthy of studying. Very interesting. In any case, that's what I printed this from. So, let's take a look at the Shulchan Aruch Ora Chaim. This is Hilchot Hanhagat Adam Baboker, the practice, the halakha of a person in the morning. Siman Aleph. This is the very first Siman of the Shulchan Aruch. And what is the very first halakha? Now, the Shulchan Aruch, just to orient you. So, as I mentioned, there are four sections of the Shulchan Aruch. These are the big sections. Ora Chaim, Yore Dea, Eben Ezer, and Choshen Mishpat. These are the four big granddaddy sections. Within each one of those sections, it's subdivided into categories. So, for example, um, the first is Hilchot Hanhagat Adam Baboker. What does a person do in the morning? Then there's going to be, for example, Hilchot Shabbat. There will be Hilchot Tefillin. There will be Hilchot Tzitzit. There are sections within Orachayim. So the first one is Hilchot Hanhagat Adam Baboker, Siman Aleph. And this is chapter one. Now, the chapters don't change as you move through sections. So, for instance, the first, the Siman Aleph is going to be talking about Hanhagat Adam Baboker, the practice of a person in the morning. By the time you get to Siman number 11, it's talking about Tzitzit. So the section name changes, but the numbers don't start over in every section. So in a way that's easier to keep track of where you are than if the numbers started over in every section and you had to find out what chapter of what subsection of what section you're in all the time. So it makes it a little bit simpler that way. So Siman Aleph Din Ashkamata Boker Ubo Tet Seifim. So the way it's set up is that the chapters in Shulchan Aruch are called Seifim. I'm sorry, are called simanim, and the halachot are called se'ifim. This is different than the Rambam. When we look at the Rambam, we're going to see his chapters are called perakim, which is more of a name for a chapter, and his halachot are called halachot. Here, it's simanim and se'ifim, which sort of means like sections and parts of the section. Part 1. Section 1, part 1. So there are nine se'ifim. So let's look at what the first one is. The first one is a total of two lines. A person should wake up, should strengthen himself like a lion to stand up in the morning to serve Hashem, to serve his creator. He should be the one, as David Amelech says, I wake up the morning. What does it mean, I wake up the morning? It means you're up before the, the light comes. 
It's as if you're waking up the morning because you're up before the morning light shines. So that is the first halakha, that a person should, should get up in the morning with energy to serve God. He shouldn't stay in bed, say, ah, oh, hit the snooze button 12 times or more, however many times you can manage to hit it. He says, he should be up. So what does it mean? Not only should he be up with strength, yitgaber ka'ari, with strength, that means he should be strong. This is talking to you, Ari, you're in the first, you're in the first sima. Ari, not only that, but it says he should wake up the dawn, which means it shouldn't just be, don't get up with lots of energy at 11 a.m. <laughs> That's not the halacha. The halacha is you get up with a lot of energy before the light comes in the morning. In other words, make the best out of your day qualitatively and quantitatively. You could wake up with lots of energy at noon, but you only have half a day. So you want to get up early and you want to get up with energy. That's the first halakha. Now, this small print here is the, are the words of Rabbi Moshe Iserlis. Rabbi Moshe Iserlis is a, was a Polish rabbi who was slightly younger than but contemporaneous with the author of the Shulchan Aruch who is often called the Mechaber or Maran Abit Yosef. So the, the Rama is what he's called, Rabbi Moshe Iserles, and he is the Ashkenazic voice who would have been a separate Shulchan Aruch, but instead decided to write his points as glosses on the Shulchan Aruch. So wherever he doesn't disagree with the, with the text, we assume he agrees. Sometimes he adds a point, and sometimes he disagrees. So here he adds a point, and remarkably, guess where he adds it from? He's going to bring something from a source that's very familiar to some of us. What does he say? Va'af! So that's why it says Haga. Haga means a note or a gloss. Nevertheless, Maybe you're not able to get up so early at 5 a.m., at 6 a.m., but at least don't get up later than they pray in the synagogue. In other words, at the very minimum, one should be up for shacharit. Okay, you don't want to get up at 4 in the morning. We understand that everybody can do that, but at least for shacharit. And he says Haga, another note. Uh, I place God before me always. This is a very famous verse from Tehillim. What does it mean? This is a great principle in the Torah. And by the way, anybody who recognizes where this is from, before we get to the end where it tells you it's from, they get a special door prize. And the, the high level... It, it, it's a, an example of, of the, the outstanding character of the righteous. Elohim, who walk before God. That a person sitting in motion and dealings when he's alone in his house is not like his sitting around and the way he moves and the way he acts when he's in the presence of a great king. And what the way that a person speaks and opens his mouth according to his will, meaning that he's very loose with his tongue, when he's with his family, when he's with his confidants, he's very comfortable. Like the way that he would speak when he's sitting with the king. You wouldn't open your mouth and speak in the presence of a king the way you would speak in the presence of your family. Certainly when he realizes that a great king, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Hashem, the Holy One, blessed be He, is standing over him and sees all of his actions. Like Yirmiyahu says, if a person hides in a hiding place, I'm not going to see him. Meaning, Hashem says, you can't hide from God. You can't hide from Hashem. So if a person really lived with that awareness, that even when they're alone, they're in the presence of Hashem, they would act differently. And that's from the Moreh Nebuchim. Isn't that funny? So it took the Ashkenazi to quote the Moreh Nebuchim from the Rambam in the first Allah Ham Shulchan Aruch. And, the Ram, and it's ironic because the, the Moreh Nebuchim was somewhat of a controversial work in its time. And yet it's in the first Seif of the first siman of the Shulchan Aruch is the Moreh Nebuchim, which was the guide for the perplexed by Maimonides, which was his very deep philosophical work. So what does he say? Immediately a person will feel fear and humility before Hashem and embarrassment before him when he thinks that, you know, what I'm doing is I'm in front of Hashem. So, that's, so this ties in, of course, with what, what the Maran opened up the Shulchan Aruch by saying, the first thing you need to know in the morning is how to get out of bed. And how do you get out of bed? You get out with energy and you get out on time. You go raring to go because you want to make the best use of that day to serve Hashem. And the, the Ramah adds 
that this is a, an awareness that should be with the person all the time, that they're standing before Hashem, that everything they do is, is part of their relationship with Hashem. And the corollary of this, it's not just that one should get up with great fervor to serve God and awareness of God, but you shouldn't be embarrassed if other people make fun of you in serving Hashem. Even when he's walking humbly with God, and when he's lying in his bed, he should remember that he's lying before Hashem. And when he wakes up from his sleep, he should get up with energy to serve God, with alacrity, with zeal, immediately. So this is trying to tell you that this awareness of Hashem is not just what should pop you out of bed in the morning, but it should be with you all the time. And it should help you have strength when other people put you down and say, ah, why are you religious? Why are you wasting your time? You go to synagogue, you do mitzvot, you're, 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 you know, you're wrong, you're not thinking correctly. There was an interesting story, I don't know if anybody saw the article, about Jacob Lew today, um, about the uh, Obama's chief of staff, how he keeps Shabbat. In the and uh, there, there was a very interesting article. I don't know, I saw it online today. Interesting article. It just talked about it. And he said, and he said it during the article a couple of times. He made, one of his main points was that when you stick to your principles, people respect you. You know, and, that, and that's what he, you know, he said, he, listen, he knows. So actually the president comes and says, you need to leave for Shabbat. <laughs> he, he's the one who tells him because he knows it's very important to him and he only took the job with the understanding listen you know I, I keep Shabbat so there's you know when, when you tell the president of the United States no matter who it is like I will only do this if I can keep Shabbat that's really saying something that's even you know and I, and I was thinking of this you know it really fits in that that's I mean we don't have we don't have a king fortunately in, uh, in our society but, but the idea of the, whoever the highest authority is being able to stand up and say I would, it's a great honor to be the chief of staff of the president of the United States and to say listen but there's Shabbat and Shabbat comes first you know that's a that's a big deal so it's an interesting article take a look but in any case this is the opener of the Shulchan Aruch very appropriate for a work that's mainly focused on how to live your life practically because that's the first thing you need to know when you wake up in the morning. Yes. So this is the din. And you're mentioned in the Shulchan Aruch. It says, Ari. I appreciate that. So this is the din. So if you don't wake up by dawn, then you get... You're makot. missing. You're missing out. No. Well, no. The, well, these types of things... The, well, that's... You only get makot for lot ase, First of all. A negative commitment. So this is talking about... It's not a suggestion because it is a halakha. It's telling you this is what one should do. It's also a halakha never to get angry. Hmm. It's all, it's all... I mean, there are many halakhot that, you know, we, we strive to do. But it's definitely a halakha, meaning that this is the ideal that one should live by. Everybody uh, makes mistakes, in, in, even in, in more technical halakhot than this, people make mistakes. But if you don't do this, you should touch your heart. Yeah, yeah, you have to do it. This is the right attitude. You're missing something. You're missing your rachamayim. That's what he's basically saying. You're missing fear of God if you don't do this. That's for sure. That's for sure. So, saif bet, what is the second saif? Now, incidentally, in this particular, uh, the first couple of simanim in the Shulchan Aruch, there's very little to compare in the Rambam. Because the Rambam doesn't have these exact halachot. We're going to see where we're going to be able to compare the two in, shortly. One who wakes up in the morning early to pray. There are three times that the Talmud tells us are auspicious for prayer at night. And these are the thirds of the night. The three are a third into the night. If you were to divide the night hours into thirds, imagine the night hours are 12 hours, so that if you, were to, if you were to divide them into equal parts, take the first third, at the end of the first third, at the end of the second third, and at, the, and at dawn, at these three moments are considered to be very auspicious times for tefillah, that because anybody who prays at these times for the, uh, over the galut, over the exile, and over the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash, it's, a very, uh, it's considered a very auspicious time to pray. And um, I'm going to pass out to you also a, uh, another sheet. This sheet has actually the tour. I mentioned that everything that we read in the Shulchan Aruch is a summary of his comments on the tour. So this is, on one side has the tour, and on the flip side of this is the, some selections from the Bet Yosef. And again, I lifted this right off a of wiki text, which is really great. I was able to cut and paste the parts that I wanted and bold the parts that I wanted instead of having to copy a whole thing. It's very nice. This is at night, three thirds at night. Yeah, so if you go into a third of the night, so let's say the night was 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., so it would be 10 p.m., 2 a.m., 6 a.m. Why does he have waking after this if this is chronologically prior to 
Um, why does he have it after this? Because I, 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 I'm assuming, that it's, that's a very good question. I'm assuming because he's not telling you what you have to do here. He's saying if, in other words, in the first halacha, he's saying what do you have to do? You have to do your best to get up immediately in the morning with a lot of energy. That, that you're supposed to do. And then he says if a person wants to pray additionally in the night, these are good times to do it. So he's not immediately talking about um, what you have to do. Not always. Not always. Not always. Mm -mm. So, he, so now th what this is is the tour on one side and the Shulchan Aruch and the uh, Bet Yosef on the other side. And so he mentions here, um, you can see in the one, two, three, fourth paragraph that I have on this page. Vetov lemishem makdim shechaven hashot shemishtanot tamishmarot shein b'shlish alayla ulasof shnei shlishay alayla ulasof alayla. So he says he explains shebe'elu azemanim akadosh baruch hu nizkar lechorban abayit upizur yisrael bein umot haolam. That this is the time where the remembrance of the exile and the destruction of the Beit Hamikdash comes before Hashem, so to speak. That's why it's a time where we're supposed to focus on it. And on the other side of the sheet where the Beit Yosef explains this, he explains um, at the very top of that other side that has the bullet points. This is from Masechet Berachot in the very beginning. You should recognize this, Moshe, because we learned this not too long ago. Masechet Berachot, Daf Gimel. Okay, very recently we learned it. Okay, he says, this is Shalosh Mishmarot Avelayla that there were three watches in the night. is the rest of that Gemara. So what it means is that at these three times Hashem says, woe is to me that I destroyed the Beit HaMikdash and I burnt it and I exiled my children and I wish they would come back. And so therefore the, the Rosh says, he says, Katava Rosh, that since you know that that's a time, where the significance of those events comes before Hashem, so to speak. Therefore, that's a time where a person should think about the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash as well. Now, what does it mean that it comes before Hashem? Basically, because there's a concept of these three mishmarot that... Now, we don't know if these mishmarot, if these... these um, these mishmarot, these watches, correspond to something metaphysical, or they correspond to something astronomical, or they correspond to the Beit HaMikdash, which also had mishmarot of Kohanim all night long. But whatever they correspond to, the point is that at those moments, Hashem recognizes what's missing from, in, in other words, at, those, at the other time it says that Hashem rec remembers the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash is whenever we say Kaddish and we say Yehesh Meir Abba Mevarach, Hashem says, look at how my people praise me and the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash. In other words, at those moments where we would feel the greatest connection to God are the times where it's most obvious how distant we are from God. So it's those moments where we're praying with the greatest kavanah that Hashem says, Think about what they could have had if they had the Beit HaMikdash. Think about what could have been. And at those watches in the night where the Kohanim would be in the Beit HaMikdash and they would be changing watches, or where the Malachim are, are alternating their watches in some metaphysical sense, that God recognizes what's missing down here on earth, that we're, we're in an imperfect state. And, uh, and similarly, in the book of Echad, it says, Kumi Roni Balayla, that you should call out to God in the night. That, uh, that this is the time to, uh, uh, to, to cry over the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash where we feel the most lacking um, of the presence of Hashem. So is this supposed so, to correspond to the Tikkun? Yeah, tikkun Chatzot is something else. See, tikkun Chatzot tikkun comes later. Mayan. Right, that's another, those Tikkunim are uh, later. Um, well, we'll see more about them later. But in Seif Gimel, he says, This is just a general principle. That, and... and he says that a person, it's proper for somebody who fears God to be sad and distressed over the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash. Meaning, it's the corollary of what we said before, that if a person really desires to serve God with all their energy in the best possible way, they should feel pain at the fact that we don't have the ideal way. That we're in the diaspora, that we're in the galut, that we're in the exile, and we don't have the opportunity to serve God. And even if we lived in Israel today, we wouldn't have the full opportunity to serve God the way that he w wanted us to serve him. So uh, together, when a person feels the greatest energy and enthusiasm for the service of God is when he feels the greatest pain of the absence of 
the service of God or the, di- the diminishment of the service of God. Just like on the holidays, when do we pray the most for the, re- the rebuilding of the Beit HaMikdash? It's on the holidays because we realize we would be going as, for a pilgrimage to Yerushalayim to the Beit HaMikdash and instead we don't have that anymore. So we feel the absence the most keenly at that time. Seif so Dalet says, now that's why this is at the beginning of the Shulchan Aruch. He's setting the tone. He's saying a person should have a great passion for the service of God and passion, just like if you love a person, then when they're absent, you feel the pain even more. If you don't care about a person, then when they're absent, you don't really care. But if you love a person, then at those moments when you're thinking about the distance from that person, you're going to feel the greater pain. So when somebody has passion for serving God, they're going to feel the distance as well. Tov me'at tachanunim bechavana, me'arbot belo chavana. These are all general principles, okay? And very important. It's better to do a little bit with kavana than to do a lot with no kavana. We don't value quantity over quality. If a person can do the basics of tefillah and skip a lot of the extras, and he knows that he'll be able to have more kavana skipping the extras, why rush through with your, your jaw moving so fast that it's becoming numb reading the prayers when you have, your brain can't register a quarter of what you're saying because you're in such a rush to finish? Better to skip parts that you're allowed to skip and just focus on the core parts of the tefillah. That, and, and we're not going to focus exactly on what those parts are. That's a whole other shiur. But the general principle is very important. Don't add on, you know, people, they read a lot of tehillim. I would rather see a person read one tehillah uh, per day and understand what they're saying. Most people, they read a lot of tehillim and they just read it. But it's better to read a little bit and to actually have kavanah to understand what you're saying. That's much more of an art. That's much more difficult to do than to add on additional... We have so many mizmorim, so many in the Pesuket de Zimran, Shabbat, it's so long. Pesuket de Zimran, Yom Kippur is so long. Actually, this year, I sat down before Yom Kippur and I went and I studied each one of those mizmorim. I said, we read this every year once at one time. You know, we're in a rush. I never get to understand what half... You know, I, I always wonder as I'm reading it, I wonder what this... I wonder what Rashi says about this, you know. I never have time to really look at the commentaries and, it, you know, during Yom Kippur, there's no time. So it's something where you need to, to try to in, in, inject some quality into the quantity. So now he comes, and I want you to notice how many things that he gives as midat chasidut. Many things that the Shulchan Aruch is going to say are nice to do, have become fixtures in the Sidur as absolute. Okay? Let's take a look. So he says, Tov lomar parashat akedah. It's nice to say the Akedah. What's the Akedah? The story of the binding of Isaac. Now, yeah, if you, if you look in Shacharit, so that's the very first thing in the, in the main body of Shacharit. After the blessings of the morning in our Sidur, after the morning blessings, you have to say, which come later, um, the Akedah is going to be there. Now, it's interesting because chronologically, this would be out of order. The first thing we should really be talking about is the blessings you say in the morning first. And it should be talking about Birchot HaShachar and Birchot Torah, the blessings on the Torah that you have to say. He doesn't go for that. He first focuses on this very, and it's, it's remarkable because the theme is the connection between our service of God and the Korbanot. Because notice, he mentioned mentioned the, the zeal of service of God, and, and then he mentioned feeling this absence of the Beit HaMikdash, and then he starts talking about things that mainly revolve around korbanot, as we're going to see, around sacrifices. So he says, a person should mention the Akedah, Uparashat Aman, which we don't have in our Sidur, but many Sidurim have that. Have the, the, the parasha from Parashat Bishalach, the section that talks about Hashem bringing the man, bringing the mana to the Jews in the, in the wilderness. It's mentioned in the Yerushalmi that somebody should read that every day. It's mentioned in the Talmud Yerushalmi that a person should read that every day because it reminds them where their parnasa comes from, where your sustenance comes from God. Okay, so, so it's a nice thing to do. Va'aserat ad-dibirot. It's meritorious to read the aserat ad-dibirot every day, the Ten Commandments every day. But then he, and that's not in our Siddur either. Uparashiyota ola. He should read the Korban Ola. Korban Ola here is talking about the, the Olat Nidava. In the very beginning of, of Parashat Vayikra, it tells us various sacrifices a person can bring voluntarily. One of them is the burnt offering, Parashat Ola. Um Mincha. A person can also bring a korban mincha. They can bring a flower offering voluntarily. Vichat ushlamim. And a person can bring a korban shilamim. He can bring a peace offering. A peace offering means that part of it is burnt on the altar and you eat part of it. It's a barbecue with a religious uh, component. Vichatat. 
and a sin offering. He reads the passage of the sin offering, ve'asham, and the guilt offering. These are all different korbanot. So what's the reason here? I'm going to show you in a second what the reason is. But basically he's telling us that we should read a selection of different korbanot. Now, we read Ezem Mekoman Shel Zivachim, which touches upon a lot of the different laws of the korbanot. And he mentions that later. He's going to mention that later. But right now he's basically telling you to read a great deal of stuff. A lot of extra stuff. After he just got done telling you that you shouldn't do so much, you should focus on quality. If somebody is going to add all of these things on top of their shacharit, it's going to be very long. Now one siddur that actually has all this is the art scroll. The art scroll has the, ma, the parashat haman. It's not a Sephardic siddur, but the art scroll has the parashat haman. It has the, not haman, the bad guy. The man, the, the man. Ha, no, so, so, ha, right, ha, man. So the, um, the, it has that, it has all of the different korbanot, the ola, the chatat, the shalamim, all the different kinds of korbanot it has in there. And he says, that, now the, the Ramah mentioned something very important here, which the, which the Maran doesn't disagree with. He says, Haga. He says, Vidavka biachid mutar lomar aserta dibrod b'cholyom. Only a person by themselves can say the Ten Commandments every day. Aval asur omram b'tzibur. But you're not allowed to say them at communally. Communally, you're not allowed to say them. And this is based on the Gemara. The Gemara tells us in Masechet Barachot also that they used to say the Ten Commandments every day as part of the service before they said the Shema. Because if you look in the Torah and Parshat V'etchanan, the Shema comes right after the mention of the Aseret Debrot, right after the mention of the Ten Commandments. So they used to say the Ten Commandments every day. But what happened? Heretics said, oh. And what, but what they meant by heretics were, was what? What group? The early Christians, the early Christians actually, said, all that matters is the Ten Commandments. And what's the proof? Even the Jews, only, they say the Ten Commandments every day. So obviously we're right. Only the Ten Commandments really count. That's all that matters. And as long as you keep the Ten Commandments, you're good. And forget about the other 600 and some odd commandments that are left. Just keep the Ten. So therefore, they said you're not allowed. They, they abrogated that. They prohibited saying the Aseret Debrot as part of the daily service because they didn't want people to come with the wrong impression that the Aseret Debrot is from God and the rest of the Torah is not from God, which is what many Christians believe, that the Ten Commandments came from God. The rest of it, you know, we can, we can work around that. We can reinterpret it. But those Ten Commandments, they, they're definitely holy. That's the way that they thought. So they didn't want to... In, that's the same reason why the Sephardic custom is we don't stand, even when we read the Ten Commandments, on Shavuot. Even when we read it in... Even when we read in Parashat Yitro, even when we read it in Parashat Vetchanan during the year, we don't stand for the Ten Commandments in Sephardic synagogue. And the reason why is because they asked the Rambam in a famous responsum, they asked the Rambam, should we do this? And he said, absolutely not. It's prohibited to stand for one part of the Torah and not other parts. Why? Because it's obvious why. Because a person's going to see that and say, oh, that's really the important part. Everyone's standing. I guess the rest is not really as holy. It's not really as much from Hashem. It's not really as important. I'm not going to pay attention to it. So we don't want to reinforce that perspective. So privately, it's nice to say the Aserat HaDibrot every day. But publicly, it's not allowed. So these are obviously, when he says, Tov Lomar, it's nice to say these things. Is he saying they're required? No. Very important distinction to make nowadays where anytime any book says something might possibly maybe or maybe not be good, all of a sudden everybody thinks you absolutely have to do it. So just to make the point, he just said it's nice if you have extra time. He says, Parashiot HaKorbanot Lo Yomar El Bayom Since sacrifices could only be given during the day, we should only say these parashiot of sacrifices during the day. So for instance, if a person gets up very, very early, especially at these times of the year where it's possible uh, until the time changes maybe for somebody easily to get up while it's well before dawn, um, even if you get up at uh, 6 o'clock, it's probably before dawn now. Um, if a person gets up at that time and wants to say the korbanot of the morning early before they come to synagogue, I sometimes do that. Um, you shouldn't say the korban tamid. You shouldn't say the korbanot part because the korbanot part is not daytime yet. Um, a person should say, if they say the korban ola, if they say the passage about the burnt offering, or they say the passage about the peace offering, or about the mincha, the flower offering, they should say a prayer after saying it, they should recite, may it be God's will, that this reciting of the passage is as if I offered the sacrifice. And there's actually a concept that if somebody does, for instance, a sin for which they would have to bring a sin offering in the times of the Beit HaMikdash, that they would have to bring a Korban Chatat, that they should say the passage of the Torah that describes the Korban Chatat, the sin offering, and then say, may it be Hashem's will, that this be counted as if 
I brought the sin offering because we can't bring it nowadays. Yomari makorbanot pasuk v'shachat oto yerech av mizbeach tzafon alafnei Hashem. There's a pasuk that says you should offer, you should slaughter this offering on the northern side of the altar before Hashem. We should always say that pasuk. We're going to see the reason for this. Yeah, we do. Yeah, it appears in our Sidur. It's a, it actually appears in our Sidur in two places. It appears in our Sidur after, in the Ezehu Mekoman section and also in the section about Akedat Yitzchak in two places. Yesh no agin nomar. Now again, notice what he says. Did he say everybody absolutely must on pain of death say the following things? No. He says, yesh no agin nomar. There are some people who say the following things. Parashat Kior, also found in the art school Sidur. I've never seen it in any Sephardic Sidor, Parashat Kior describes the lever from which the Kohanim would wash. They had a special washing station that they would wash their hands and feet before serving. V'acharkach Parashat Rumat Adeshen, also the cleaning off of the altar every day, the first service that the Kohen did in the morning when he would come to the Beit HaMikdash, if he was on duty that day, is he would clear the ashes from yesterday's sacrifices, take a scoop of them and put them on the side of the altar to clean it off, to, to represent that it's a new day. That was the first service that he did. So many people would read that. V'achar kach parashat tamid. People would say after that, parashat tamid, the daily sacrifice. V'achar kach parashat mizbeach miktar ketoret. After that, the description of the altar, the incense of altar. The, I'm sorry, the altar of incense, which is the inner altar. And the, there are two altars in the, in the Beit HaMikdash. There was an outer one where they burnt sacrifices and an inner one where they only burnt ketoret. Only, uh, only the incense was burnt. Ufarashat simanea ketoret vasiato. And then the parasha of the simanea ketoret vasiato, of the um, various parts of the ketoret. That's pituma ketoret. Right? That's pituma ketoret. Right. Pituma ketoret. right. So pituma ketoret, re- re- reciting the ketoret, reciting the, uh, the incense passage, where we mention first, in our custom, we mention first the pesukim, the verses that describe it, and then we mention the actually the braitot, we mention the, the rabbinic explanation of how it was actually done. So this is a custom. People have attached a great significance to it because the Zohar in the Kabbalah, the Kabbalah speaks very, very highly of the significance of the incense and the Ketoret as, as, uh, as being extraordinarily important. But in the Shulchan Aruch, if you read it, it's the last thing on the list, not even the first thing. He lists all of these other things and then at the end he says, V'yeshno, again, there's some people, meaning he might not have even done it. You know, oh, There's some people who they also say these things. Has anybody here ever said the parashat kior about the washing of hands? And then, no. Has anybody ever said the trumat edition? I never did. I know it's in the art school sidur, but I, I might have read it when I was a kid just to see what was in there because it has so many things about the korbanot in there. But I don't think I ever read it as part of the shacharit. Parashat tamid, I think everybody does. Uh, you know, the, the, the regular offering, Tzavet B'nai Yisrael V'amartah Lehem at Korbani Lachmi, that most people say in the Shacharit, that's true. Um, but does anybody read the section that describes the incense altar? I've never heard of such a thing. And so, and at the very end of the list, he mentions the Ketoret as if that's like the last thing. But today, that's, that's assumed great significance. Now, right, the Ramam mentions it later when he talks about Mincha. Right, when, he, when he mentions it in Mincha, he's going to mention the custom of reading it also at Mincha because half of it was brought in the morning and half in the afternoon. But the point that I'm trying to make here is not to, not to diss the Ketorah, just to point out that halacha me'ikara din, if we're following the general principle, and I think that in a way we have to look at se'if hey, or I'm sorry, se'if dalid as a warning sign for the other se'ifim in the section. Okay? Se'if dalid was tov me'at tachanonim bechavana. Meharbot belo chavana, which means better to have a little bit with a lot of concentration than a lot with no concentration. That's like a warning sign. And then he says, here's all the things that some people add into the tefillah. Okay? And then he gives you a list of things in the tefillah that most people don't say, but some people do. What's the point? He said, if you have time that you can really read this with kavana, kol kavod, do it. But if you don't, I already told you in Saif Dalet, don't do it. If you're going to rattle it off like you're reading a shopping list, like you're an auctioneer, you ever heard those auctioneers, you know? If that's how you're going to read it, skip it. Because this is just yesh no agim. Some people have a custom to say this. Who are the people who have a custom to say it? The people who have time. If you're not among the people who have time, you know, I remember once I was visiting a synagogue and there was a, uh, and I was the guest of a, a rather wealthy individual. I didn't realize how wealthy he was when he invited me for Shabbat until I got to see his home. And we went, to, what I noticed about this gentleman was whenever we would come to a, a we, would, we went like to the synagogue and the synagogue had very wide doors, very wide, like you would go into a hall 
like the social hall. So the doors were like very wet. He would walk all the way to the side to kiss the mezuzah. Like he would walk like five feet over to get to the mezuzah to kiss it when he would walk in any door. Okay, now most of us, if we're right next to the door, that's one thing. But if you had to walk, you know, out of your way to get the mezuzah, that, that's already... So I said to myself, you know what? That's a person with time. <laughs> that's a person with time. You know, he has the time to walk all the way over there to kiss the mezuzah. He has time. Not everybody has that time. He has time to say all these things. Everybody else, I'm not so sure. Yes, what did you have to say? Ah, so I wanted to get to the Rambam. He's on the other side of this sheet. Yes, so Sheldon, before we go to that. My understanding means too thick. means to judge yourself, to self, self-evaluate is the best term. It doesn't even mean just to think. It's a specific type of thinking. And so ironic that, that we all rush, we think we're accomplishing something by rushing through the prayers because we have to punch, you know, we have to punch the card that we, we appear that we mm-hmm. did, but... There's no point to it if you don't think about what you're saying. How about this? Instel- instead of prayer being self-judgment, it becomes a self-indictment. Because it ends up just being another, ex- another expression of the fact that we're not doing the right thing. Instead of really doing it with quality. It should be a self-judgment that really you're thinking and reflecting on who you are and where you stand. And in order to do that, honestly, you have to budget your time. Because if we spend a tremendous amount of time adding things to the prayers in the beginning, then when we get to the core prayers, we're already worn out. We already don't have energy for it anymore. We're already in a rush. Uh, you know, and, and that's why it's important that we try to budget our time and budget our focus. Because a person, most people have a limited quantity of attention span that they can spend on the tefillah. And we want to spend it where it's most important. And that's during the Kriyat Shema and the Amidah, mainly. And the, and the, sele- and the middle part of the Psuket de Zimra, from Ashrei to the Hallelujah, those are the key Mizmorim. Those are the key parts you want to do. The Shema with the Barachot and the, and the Amidah and the Tachanunim right after the Amidah. Those are really the core, core, core things. If you can have Kavanah during that time, and maybe even, you know, if you can have Kavanah for the Ashrei and Uval Etzion at the end, that's even better. But beyond that, I mean, who can have Kavanah for an... Uh, 20 minutes of korbanot before. Yeah, that's important. I'm just trying to say that these are the important parts where you should try. Like the Rambam writes to one of his students in a letter. He asked him, how do you reach the highest level of perfection? And it, uh, he said, first of all, you just pay it, for the first couple of years, just pay attention to the Shema, the Tefillah, and the Kriyat Torah. He said, really? That's all I have to do? He said, yeah, just, kind of, just pay attention when they're reading the Shema, pay attention when you're reading the prayer, the Amidah, and pay attention when they're reading the Torah in the synagogue. That's the first step to becoming a great tzaddik. And he's talking to one of his top students, meaning that he realizes this guy's not doing that. And most people are not doing that. The basic kavana. And that's the beginning of getting on the right road. Now, if we turn to the other side, the Rambam has very little to say about most of this. So his seder tefilot is in the en- at the end of what's called Sefer Ahava in the Rambam. Remember, the Rambam is organized not practically, not in terms of a person's day, but conceptually. So it's divided up conceptually, starting with what's called Sefer Hamada, the book of knowledge that goes through the knowledge a Jew has to have to be a good Jew who knows the principles of Judaism. And then it gets into what's called Sefer Ahava, the book of love, which talks about the mitzvot that remind us of Hashem continually, like saying the Shema, like saying the Tefillah, like saying, like wearing tzitzit and tefillin and so on. So that's how it's organized. At the end of Sefer Ahava, he has Seder Tefillot, which is the order of, t- of prayers. And what does he say in the beginning? He says, Na'agua am likrot b'chol yom b'shachar achar shikorin parashat tzav u'birkat koanim. Korin Mishnah He says, oh, what we have in the morning is, this is all he had for korbanot. Par- parashat tzav is the korban tamid. That's the daily sacrifice offering. That's one little paragraph that we all know that we read on Rosh Chodesh too. He should read Birkat Kohanim. That's four Pesukim. And then he reads this Mishnah. We all recognize this Mishnah. These are the things that have no measure. These are the things that you consume the reward in this world, that you still have the reward in the next world, right? You benefit from the reward in this world, but you get the full reward in the next world. And then he quotes another couple of Mishnayot here. And then he gets to Le'olam Yehei Adam Yerei Shamayim Baseter Kivagaloyu Maudel Emet, which is also found in our Sidur, and ending with. Um, which is also in our Sidur, that little piece, although we have a different version of it. We have a, a little bit of a different version of it. So basically, in the Rambam's view, it would be a very short korbanot. He doesn't have any of the other stuff. He doesn't have the Akedah. 
He doesn't have Ezehu Mekoman Shel Zevachim. He doesn't have Rabbi Yishmael Omer. He doesn't have any of the large sections that we have in our Korbanot section. He would tell you, just say, the Korban Tavid, which is a little paragraph, Le'olam Yehe Adam, which is also, which is a lengthy paragraph, but a, a very worthwhile one that ends with the Shema. And Atahu Hashem Elohim, which is right after that mini Shema that you say in the Brachot section. And that's it. That's all you would have. After that is Baruch Shemar, according to the Rambam. He doesn't have Hodu. He doesn't have Arum Emcha. There's nothing. And if you look at it, yeah, if you look at the Sidur of the Temanim, that's what they have. The Sidur of the Temanim doesn't have Hodu Lashem Kiru Vishmo. It doesn't have Arum Emcha. It doesn't have Mizmor Shir Chanukat Tabai the David. It goes right to Baruch Shemar. It's very short. Rambam. Now, now the, the contemporary Temanim, though, they added a lot of extra stuff, but, you know, the, the real purists, the, right, the real purists, they still follow the original way. Um, they have a totally different Tachanunim also. It's very interesting, actually. Yeah, I used their, tach, I used their Sidur for a while just to get to know it a little bit, to, to learn the, their Tefillot. Very interesting and pretty much very close to what the Rambam has here. Um, as you can see, it would be a very short Birchot uh, Shachar that would last just this one column here, and that would be it. So the Rambam doesn't have much by way of Korbanot. That's why I said he doesn't have much to compare to the Shulchan Aruch here. But I did want to point out in the previous sheet just where the Bet Yosef explains why the Korbanot are important. So we do understand that. Let's just take a look at that. Um, why the Akedah is said, and we're going to conclude with that. Why the Akedah is said, why do we say the binding of Isaac? Why is that important? And why is it important to say the Korbanot? So where it says, Uparshat Akedah says, Kedelis that he says the reason is to remember the zechut avot. To remember, we're on this page that has the bullet points on it. To remember the the uh, merits of our forefathers. And also to humble ourselves, that we should be as willing to give ourselves over to the service of God as Yitzchak Avinu was willing. Or you could even say as Abraham was willing to sacrifice his son. So a person should have that type of commitment and devotion and also should remember the Zechut Avot. Actually, the Rambam mentions in the Moreh Nebuchim, he also mentions that one of the fundamental principles of the Torah is that whatever we have, it's because of Zechut Avot. Whatever we have, don't think that you're so deservant of the blessings that you have. It's because of the, the merits of the earlier generations that we have what we have. And that's why we always mention that in the prayers. We always say the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We always, rem we always mention the merits of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because we don't feel entitled to demand anything from God on our own merit. Even Moses, even Moshe Rabbeinu says in the Gemara that w you notice the humility of Moshe Rabbeinu. He doesn't say save the people because of me. He says, what about Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov? What about you, Mo Moshe Rabbeinu? You're not good enough. No, he doesn't mention it. He says, Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. Even he realizes he wouldn't be there if it wasn't for Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. So certainly, we should feel the same way. So that's why we mentioned the Akedah. Then it says, what is the reason for Parashat Korbanot? So he quotes a, uh, a, a Gemara from uh, Ta'anit, from Masechet Ta'anit, that says, Amar Abraham lefnei HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that Abraham said to the Holy One, blessed is he, Shem Yehetu Yisrael Lefanecha, what if the Jewish people sin before you? And you destroy them like you did to the generation of the flood. How do I know? How can you guarantee me? As we're going to see, actually, it's in this week's parasha. Abraham says to God, how do I know I'm going to inherit anything? How do I know this is going to come true? And what he meant was, not that I don't believe you. I don't trust my children. How do I know that my descendants are going to be such great, righteous people that you're going to fulfill the promise? He says, Amar lo He says, don't worry, that's not going to happen. So Amar Lo, he said, How do I know it's not going to happen? Amar Lo, Hashem said to him, So then Hashem says to Abraham, Bring a sacrifice. What do the sacrifices symbolize? That means that when the Jews stray, they'll be able to find atonement by bringing sacrifices and doing teshuvah, repenting. So what does Abraham say? He says, That's good. Amar Ribono Very nice. Tenach bezman shebet hamikdash kayam. Remember, Avraham was the first Talmudic scholar, so he even asked questions like the Talmud. That makes sense when they had the Beit HaMikdash. What about now? What's going to happen when they don't have the Beit HaMikdash like today? Does that mean we're lost? We can't bring Korbanot? So what does he say? I've given them the order of Korbanot. Whenever they read the Korbanot, 
I'm going to count it as if they brought the korban. And I'm going to forgive them all of their sins. In other words, what's the idea? Korbanot are not about the physical performance. True, the physical performance has an impact. It has a significance. It has a power to it. There's a reason why God wanted us to bring korbanot. It, it has, a, it has a, uh, a significant influence on us and it has a power to it and an impact that reading doesn't have. But really, beneath the surface, the korban is a symbolic action. The korban is only as good as the meaning behind the korban. So what God is saying to Abraham is, true, they won't have the physical korbanot, so maybe it won't pack the same punch that the actual korbanot, or the, imagine going into the Beit HaMikdash. It has a, I mean, even going to the Kotel, we don't have a Beit HaMikdash, it has an amazing, you know, psychologically and, and spiritually and emotionally, it has a tremendous power to be in that place. Even though it's not even with a Beit HaMikdash. Are you closer to God there than anywhere else? Of course not. God is everywhere. God is nowhere and everywhere. He's, he's metaphysical. He's not limited to a place. So he's not more there than anywhere else. But, there's a, but for the person who's standing there to be at the Kotel, to be in the Beit HaMikdash was a, tremendous, a, a tremendously powerful and inspiring experience. So certainly the Korbanot physically would have an impact. But we can still retain a connection to the Korbanot by reading and studying and understanding the meaning of the Korbanot. And that's what God said to Abraham. That even though... Right now, there will be times in history where they don't have the physical korbanot to offer. They can still read the korbanot and relate to the message, the idea behind the korbanot, study the laws of the korbanot. One of the things that I've been able to, to pick up is that from studying the laws of the korbanot, because I always had a fascination with it, I don't know why, but I always had an interest in it. Because people don't appreciate how, just like every area of halakha is very sophisticated and deep, korbanot, people look at it as so arcane, they don't get into it. But if you really study the laws of korbanot, it's, it's amazing. I mean, it's profound. The ideas, the halachot, it's just as sophisticated as anything else in the Torah. The way that the Torah formulates the korbanot is, and, and integrates and interweaves these ideas and, and the message of the korbanot with the structure of how they're done, it's really amazing. And even you can learn from Torah Shebikhtav, even if you read the Chumash and the commentaries, why the sacrificial service is conducted the way it is, you see the depth of it and the profundity of it, which shouldn't be understated. So we really can learn a great deal. And when, you, when, when, the, when the Gemara talks about reading the korbanot, it doesn't mean a superficial reading. It means to try to understand it. It means that you should understand the korbanot. And by reading in the passage, you're reminding yourself of the idea that you learned. So to really appreciate the reading of the passages of korbanot, or, any, or the akedah, or any of the other things we read in the prayers, you really have to have studied them and given it time to, you know, to be able to, to understand the depth. Every one of these verses that we read, in the, we read thousand verses a day in, in, the, in, in the prayers, and every one of them, every word of every one of them has so much to tell us that we don't have time to, to hear. So if you really study it, then when you read it, it reminds you, it evokes those ideas again. And that's the concept that Hashem was telling Avraham in the Midrash, that the people might not have the physical korbanot, but if they study the korbanot and they read those passages of korbanot, it can be a, a substitute for the korbanot because they can connect to the same idea and theme that the korban had. Now we have also here, he mentions... Um, Similarly, Vamrinan Besof Menachot, it says in Masechet Menachot, Amar Rabbi Yitzchak, Rabbi Yitzchak said, Mai dechtiv zot Torah tachatat. What does it mean? This is the Torah tachatat. This is the Torah, the instruction of the chatat, of the sin offering. Why does it use the word Torah? Vizot Torah ta'asham. This is the Torah of the asham. Torah is a word that means instruction, but why does it use that word? Kola osek betorat chatat. Anybody who studies the Torah of the sin offering. In other words, he studies the ideas. He studies the halachot. By referring to it as the Torah of the asham. That means that by learning about the asham, by learning about the sin offerings, you, in a way, benefit as if you offered the sin offerings. And that's what he says at the end. Mumashi katav. This is quoting the tour. So he mentions the Korban Tamid and why. And he mentions at the bottom here the, uh, uh, that the, there's a source in the Midrash for reading the special Pasuk of Vishachat Oto. We, said, we read in the Shulchan Aruch that he said you should always read this verse Vishachat Oto al Yerech Mizbeach Tzafona. That you should that the uh, Kohen will, will slaughter the offering to the north of the Mizbeach. That the Midrash says that this verse is also a reference 
to Akedat Yitzchak. That's why we read it also after the Akedat Yitzchak. It's a reference to the binding of Isaac that the sacrificial service should remind us that we don't sacrifice human beings. We sacrifice substitutes. We sacrifice animals. But they evoke the Zechut of Abraham who was willing to sacrifice anything that God told him. Even though God doesn't want human sacrifice. He rejects it. It's, a, it's an abomination because we don't believe that any human being can die for anybody else uh, or be the possession of somebody else that they have a right to sacrifice. We don't have that concept. But we remember Abraham's devotion when we bring Korbanot. And that verse, according to the Midrash in Vayikra Rabbah, is a reminder of that concept. So what we see um, is that from looking at this first Siman of Shulchan Aruch, we walk away with a lot of great ideas. The right attitude towards divine service, both the positive attitude a person should have and the feeling of being bummed out, being frustrated that we don't have as ideal of a situation as we wish we could have. The idea of budgeting our time and our kavanah, make the most out of your prayer by studying the prayers, understanding the prayers so that you can maximize what you get out of the prayers. Don't overdo the amount that you add. Don't try to say everything if you know that by budgeting your focus you can get more out of limiting and narrowing um, the amount that you say. And then he talks about the idea of studying the korbanot and how understanding the korbanot, since the prayers are a substitute for the korbanot in many ways, and the prayer service is well, all that we have. We say, that our lips should pay, should, should fulfill or should fill the place of sacrifices. So uh, in that way, our and we know that the, the three tefillot of the day and the musaf, the, the prayers that we have are, uh, are in a way uh, fixed in their respective times to represent the sacrifices, to quote, not replace them, but to represent them. So there's a connection definitely between our prayers and the sacrifices. So by studying the sacrifices and understanding them and incorporating them into the prayers, we recall these ideas and we recall these, uh, you know, these principles and we, we integrate them into our prayer experience. Just like the Beit HaMikdash would do for us if we had the Beit HaMikdash, our prayer experience would have also this this sacrificial element. We don't have that today, but we approximate it by incorporating in some way or another the sacrificial service into the text of the prayers. And Bezrat Hashem, we'll continue next week with the Simatet. Thank you for coming. Awesome.